Hi, I'm Skip Nipper. Welcome to my podcast, where I tell you about Nashville's great baseball history and traditions. Shot to write a one-hop liner. Certainly about its past, especially about Tom Wilson Park, Herschel Greer Stadium, Sulphur Dale, but also a little bit about its present and future, too. Yes, he can. It makes the waist-high catch. And I introduce you to players, coaches, and other fans and their love for everything baseball. A high fly ball down the right field corner going way back and hits a lead off home run. Hello, baseball fans. Great to be with you again. It's great to talk about Nashville baseball and Nashville baseball history. The weather's been cold and hot, and I'm missing a ball game or two today because it's not quite 50 degrees. It's hard for me to sit out at my old age and about at a baseball game. But I'm looking forward to the spring, and I know you probably are too if you haven't already been watching a couple of college games that cranked up this this week. I want to talk to you a little bit today about the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. If you've never been, it's worth a few hours of your time. It celebrates athletes of all forms from all across the great state of Tennessee and honors athletes, teams, coaches, sports writers, and sports executives for their contributions to sports Not only just Nashville, even though it's located in Nashville, I think it got its start in Knoxville, moved some time ago, but all over the state of Tennessee. It inducted its first class in 1966, and now there are over 500 honorees and inductees recognizing those honorable Tennessee athletes and others, and some overcame obstacles to accomplish such goals. It's located in Bridgestone Arena, where the home of the Nashville Predators. It's easily accessible for either a modest fee or sometimes free, as there are donors who allow folks to visit at no charge. And if you've not been, pay a visit. Now, this is Black History Month, so I thought this week I would talk to you about, since my subject is baseball, I thought I'd highlight some of the inductees in the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame who played Negro Leagues ball. Now, For one way or the other, they had to overcome those obstacles I talked about a minute ago to accomplish their goals in sports. I'm not sure to become a member of the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame or any Hall of Fame is actually a goal. Maybe it is after someone retires, but during their playing days, I'm not sure anyone has in their mind that they'd like to hopefully be in in a Hall of Fame of of some subjects. And I can't name them all that are former Negro Leaguers. There's over 500 in the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. And for me to go through and try to find them all that had some connection to Negro Leagues baseball would be almost impossible. Or it would be possible, but it would take me a while. But some of them may or may not be well known. And I want to kind of call out a couple of those. And later on, I'm going to give you a few omissions that I think stand out also. Like, for example, one who you probably cannot recognize, or maybe you do, is David Williams, who had an impact on national and international sports through his Tennessee-based work as the first black athletic director in the Southeastern Conference at Vanderbilt. He was the first black vice chancellor and the first black general counsel, and I think he was a friend to athletics at Vanderbilt, and I know he was because at baseball games for Tim Corbin's squad because you'd see Mr. Williams there a lot. But did you know he played for the Philadelphia Stars Negro League team in the early 1950s? Probably not. It's not even addressed in his bio in the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame, but he did. And there are more, and I want to begin with one we know very well in Nashville, and that's Jim Jr. Gillum. He was honored in 1995, the teams that he played for, the Brooklyn Dodgers, the Los Angeles Dodgers, but before that, the Nashville Black Vols and the Baltimore Elite Giants. And of all the tributes paid to him, perhaps the most monumental was when his number 19 was retired by the L.A. Dodgers just two days after his death in October of 1978. Now, Junior Gillum was born in Nashville in 1928. He was a 21-year-old member of the Baltimore Elite Giants of the old Negro National League, when his contract was purchased by the Dodgers, and he spent two years at Montreal honing his skills before breaking into the Dodger lineup on opening day in 1953. He was a second baseman, and what a lot of people don't know is he displaced the great Jackie Robinson, who moved over to third in 
often to first base. As a Dodger second baseman, Gillum led the National League with 17 triples, scored a career-high 125 runs, and was named Rookie of the Year in the National League for that season. In 1956, 57, and 59, he finished second to Willie Mays in stolen bases and played 14 seasons in Brooklyn and Los Angeles and appeared in an unbelievable seven World Series. Maury Wills credited the self-sacrifice and discipline of Gillum, who hit behind him in the lineup with allowing him to break the all-time stolen base record at the time. And Gillum was respected by his teammates for his work ethic and his character. And though playing on a star-studded squad, no one developed his natural skills more than Junior or was more important to the success of his championship teams. I think he was a true inspiration. Nashville's junior, Jim Gillum, left a proud legacy of dignity and excellence on and off the diamond. And you may know that in 2015, when the Nashville Sounds opened their new ballpark, first Tennessee Park, now first Horizon Park, they renamed Jackson Avenue in front of the ballpark where you enter. They renamed that junior Jim Gilliam Way, a fitting tribute to Junior Gillum. Another one you may know about, Henry Kimbrough. Henry Allen Kimbrough was inducted into the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame in 2004. Now, let me give you a list of the teams that he played for. The Washington Elite Giants, the Homestead Grays, the New York Black Yankees, and the Baltimore Elite Giants. He was raised in Nashville, where he was born, and he grew up playing baseball in the city parks, Napier, Hadley, and others. And he began his professional career with Thomas Wilson's Elite Giants, a team that originated from the Nashville Elite Giants and later became the Baltimore Elite Giants in the Negro Leagues. Known as one of the best leadoff men, Henry Kimbrough constantly hit line drives and used his speed to stretch a single into an extra base hit. With a combination of speed and a rifle arm, he was considered one of the best center fielders to ever play the game. And during his career, he achieved a lifetime batting average of 315 and appeared in six All-Star games. And in 1945, Henry Kimbrough led the league in stolen bases and finished only one home run behind league leaders Josh Gibson and Buck Leonard. That's tall company. In 1946, he tied with Cool Papa Bell for the league lead in at-bats. He hit for a 371 average, and he led the league in runs scored. And the next season, in 1947, he hit 353 and tied for the lead in doubles. After his retirement from baseball, Henry Kimbrough returned home to Nashville where he and his Cuban-born wife, Erbia Mendoza Kimbrough, raised their children, and he successfully operated Bill's Cab Company for 22 years. And during this time, he received various honors for his baseball achievements. He was selected for the Baltimore Orioles Baseball Wall of Fame and the Milwaukee Brewers Wall of Fame. He was honored during the 1993 Major League Baseball All-Star Game, and honors came from the Atlanta Braves Baseball Organization, the Negro League Baseball Museum, the Black Sports Writers Organization, and others. And for a man who was limited to a sixth-grade education, Henry Kimbrough was most proud of sending his four children to colleges to obtain their degrees. Larry, who had a B.S. at Tennessee State, Harriet, who had a B.S. at Fisk, a master's at Florida State, and a doctorate from Temple University. And Philip graduated at Fisk University with a bachelor's degree, and Maria, a bachelor's and a master's degree from Florida A&M University. Dr. Harriet Kimbrough Hamilton and I are friends, and she loves to talk about her dad, and I'm grateful to know her and hear those stories. Then here's one you probably will remember if you've been paying attention to Nashville baseball history recently, Norman Thomas Stearns, who is nicknamed Turkey. He was inducted into the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame in 2010, and the teams that he played for were the Nashville White Sox, the Nashville Elite Giants, the Montgomery Gray Sox, the Detroit Stars, and later the Chicago American Giants. 
He was born in Nashville, got his nickname at an early age from his unusual running style, is why it's told in one story and other stories it's a little different. But he was a pitcher at Pearl High School in Nashville, but at age 15, he left school to work to help his family because his father died. And later he continued his baseball, playing with the Southern teams in the Negro League, including the Nashville Elite Giants, the Montgomery Gray Sox. But he was discovered by Detroit Stars manager Bruce Petway in 1923, and many felt that Stearns was the league's best-kept secret, and I'll tell you more about Bruce Petway in a little while. He was also from Nashville. Now, Stearns was a five-time All-Star selection to the East-West All-Star Classic in Chicago. He was a home run hitter, and he had scorching speed. I never counted my home runs, Turkey Stearns once said. If it didn't win a game, it didn't matter. And during his career, Turkey Stearns quietly gobbled up three batting titles in 1931 and 1939 with 350 averages. And in 1935, if you can believe it, with a career-high 430 batting average. He's considered by many to be one of the greatest players in the history of baseball, but due to his race and his quiet personality, he really never received the recognition that he deserved. He batted over 400 three times, and he led the Negro Leagues in home runs seven times. And he's credited with at least 103 home runs in his career, and maybe more. The all-time Negro League record, as it stands, and 50 more than second place, Mule settles. He finished his active career in 1941 with the Kansas City Monarchs. And later, he had played briefly for the local semi-pro Detroit Black Sox, where he lived, and he ended his career at age 44 with the Toledo Cubs of the newly formed United States League in 1945. His trophy collection includes three batting championships and six home run crowns, but unfortunately, he did not live to see his induction into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 2000. But a plaque in Stern's honor is on display outside the center field gate at the Tigers' home field, Comerica Park. And here's what Satchel Page said about Turkey Stearns. He could hit it over the right field fence, over the left field fence, or center field fence. He was one of the greatest hitters we ever had. He was as good as anybody who ever played baseball. Now, another great uh, player that came from Tennessee named Wild Bill Wright, Burnis, B-U-R-N-I-S, Wright. Wild Bill was honored in 2017 and inducted into the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. And the teams he played for included the Nashville Elite Giants, the Baltimore Elite Giants, and then had a terrific career in the Mexican Baseball League. Now, Wild Bill Wright was born in Milan, Tennessee in 1914. Played baseball for the Gibson County Buffaloes school team, and in 1932, at the age of 18, made his career debut in the Negro Leagues playing for the Nashville Elite Giants. He stayed with the Giants as they moved home cities three times, eventually rooting themselves in Baltimore. Nicknamed Wild Bill due to pitching control problems, the six foot four 220 pound man excelled as a switch hitting outfielder. He earned two Negro League batting titles, hitting 410 for Washington in 1937 and 404 for Baltimore in 1939. And that was the year the Baltimore Afro American newspaper published a story that said, besides being the fastest man in the league, Bill Wright, the sensational outfielder of the Baltimore Elite Giants, is also the best hitter. In 1940, a time when Major League Baseball still prohibited players of color, Wright was one of the many standout players from the Negro League who chose to move to the Mexican Baseball League. And in his first season, he hit 360 with 94 runs, 30 doubles, and 29 stolen bases. And the next season, in 1941, he batted 390 and led the league, beating out Josh Gibson and other standout players. He also had 26 stolen bases that led the league, and in 1943, with Mexico City's Red Devils, he won the Mexican League Triple Crown 
batting 366 with 13 homers and 17 RBIs. He outperformed stars like Roy Campanella, Josh Gibson, and Monty Irvin, all who went on to be enshrined in Cooperstown, and Campanella called Wright the biggest, strongest, fastest man that I've ever seen. And he was also called the Black DiMaggio. He was a seven-time Negro League Baseball All-Star in the 30s and 40s and was later inducted into the Mexican Professional Baseball Hall of Fame. He became a national celebrity in Mexico, and he found discrimination less pronounced than in America, and he operated a hamburger cafe called The Dugout. And there he lived until his death in August of 1993 in a city which I can't pronounce the name. But from the obscure to the forgotten, there are more I would like for you to know. I mentioned earlier catcher Bruce Petway. He was known as having superb arm strength during his Negro League career with the Leland Giants, the Philadelphia Giants, the Chicago American Giants, and Detroit Stars. Born December the 23rd, 1885 in Nashville, Petway was manager and a teammate of Turkey Stearns between 1923 and 1925. He's not in the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame, but in a game in Cuba, he once threw out in an exhibition game, Ty Cobb, and the story goes that he did it not once, not twice, but three times as Cobb was trying to steal second. Another one I talked about a lot because I love him, I thought he was a great man. Clinton Butch McCord began his baseball career in 1947 when he signed with his hometown Nashville Cubs out of Tennessee State University. The next season, he was with the Baltimore Elite Giants and later spent 11 seasons in organized baseball. He won two silver gloves as the best first baseman in minor league baseball. Born in Nashville, the baseball field at Tennessee State University was named in his honor because he gave money to have it, and it's no longer there. Bush McCord is not in the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. Another one you may know the name, but you may not know his career, was Sam Whitman. After he was discharged from the Army, he returned to Tennessee State in 1953 and was hired as an assistant coach, and he stayed as the assistant coach for 16 years. He served as the head baseball coach during this time and compiled 300 victories and established himself as the winningest baseball coach in Tennessee State history. In 1968, he was named head football coach at Fisk, and there he led the team to its first ever championship and first nationally televised appearance. And he returned to TSU in 1978, where he served as athletic director and taught biology until his retirement in 1996. And a few years ago, he was named the National Old Timers Baseball Association's Mr. Baseball in honor of what he had done for baseball in the city. And no, Sam Whitman did not play in the Negro Leagues, but he uh, he had an influence on several players who played for him at Tennessee State, who did, and I think he's worthy. Another one who is worthy, I just can't believe that Tom Wilson is not in the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. But if it were up to me and Harriet Kimbrough Hamilton, Dr. Hamilton is diligent in her efforts to bring his name to the forefront so that maybe in the next year he will be named to the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. She calls him the father of Nigger Leagues baseball in Nashville. In 1918, the Standard Giants Semi-Pro Club in Nashville was purchased by Thomas T. Wilson, a native of Atlanta who had moved with his family to Nashville where his parents studied medicine at Meharry. And as a young man, he accumulated wealth through his interests in entertainment, a local rail line, and ownership in nightclubs. And on March the 26th, 1920, he and seven investors pooled $5,000 and chartered a Tennessee corporation called the Nashville Negro Baseball Association and Amusement Company. And it said that the purpose was to organize baseball clubs and encourage the art of playing the game of baseball according to high and honorable standards and of encouraging the establishment of a league of clubs in different sections of the state. Well, he turned his standard Giants team into a Negro Leagues team called the Elite Giants, and he built a ballpark for them in Nashville and later moved them from Nashville to Columbus, Ohio, to Washington, D.C., and finally before they settled in Baltimore. 
and he began minor league baseball teams in Nashville, the Black Vols and Cubs, to feed players into his Negro League clubs up north. Wilson became an officer in the Negro National and Negro Southern Leagues, was a friend to all, and after his ball club moved to Baltimore, he tore down his ballpark and he built the Paradise Ballroom in that location, and white and black people were entertained there, too. And they were entertained by people like Cab Calloway and Lena Horne and other jazz greats who came to the Paradise Ballroom. Well, that's a, just a few. There are many, many more uh, than can really be imagined who are great athletes and included baseball in their sports career, like I said before, not just in Nashville, but throughout Tennessee. And Bob Griffith comes to mind. You have to look him up. I'll have more about him later. And so does Jim Zapp and Sidney Bunch Jr. and even Charlie Pride, they're not in the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame, and they may not qualify, but in my book, they certainly are worthy of discussion and consideration. If you'd like to know more about the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame, certainly pay a visit there, but you can find online their address is tshf.net, and it's worthy to go through there and take a look. There's a search engine search box there that you can enter somebody's name and find out more about who has been inducted into the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. As this is February and Black History Month, I'm happy to highlight some of the players in baseball and others that we need to give attention to. And I'll have more next time, but I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope you'll come back and listen to more. And as always, thanks for listening.